Welcome to Lost in Revision. All of our content is public domain, literature, fairy tales, and folklore. We are here to celebrate the original stories, not just read the modern sanitized versions. We post short segments of stories daily and monthly full episodes where we read and discuss popular classics. Come and find us on Patreon to listen to the full chapters early and without interruption. Our goal is to at least break even to cover our expenses, so any support that you can offer to help us reach that goal helps keep this podcast going and you entertained. All of our music is by Nathan Hubble and is used with his permission. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Chapter 4. Paul Bunyan's Return. Part 3. There was one thing, however, which the Gumbaroo greatly feared, and which he had no protection against, and that was fire. He was a very flammable nature, burning like celluloid if fire ever touched him, and finally blowing up with the tremendous force of giant powder. Woodsmen claim that occasionally the creatures could be heard exploding with loud reports when they happen to get caught in forest fires, and it is thought that the increasing prevalence of such fires has had much to do with their scarcity of recent years. So fearful of fire were they that just the smell of smoke would drive them far away, and it was through knowledge of this weakness that Paul and his men eventually cleared the deacon's woods of these fierce creatures. Dermelanticulus explodus is the scientific name of the Gumbaroo. It is believed to be totally extinct at the present time, though occasionally during forest fires, woodsmen will insist that they hear explosions and can detect the odor of burning rubber, which they claim are sure signs that another Gumbaroo has just met his well-deserved fate. However, there is no authentic authentic proof that the animal has been seen in recent years. So, it was not very strange that the deacon could find no one willing to log off Timberlands where agora pelters and gumbaroos were lying in wait. Paul Bunyan, however, was quite different from other men, and he just laughed at the danger. I'm your man, deacon, he promised, and they at once began discussing terms. When they had come to an agreement, Paul said, You draw up the papers, Deacon, and arrange for the necessary supplies of grub and tools and the other things. I'll strike out for the woods at once, pick a location for my camp, and start getting my crew together. It'll soon be late fall now, and I want to start cutting by the time the first snow comes. Are there any men in town that I might have use for? The old man snorted in disgust. All pretty poor stuff except old Swedish Ollie the blacksmith, he replied. He's the biggest man around here, though not so big as you. When he puts shoes on a horse, he takes the animal up on his lap like a baby. He's a mighty good blacksmith, all right, but I expect folks will be glad to get him out of town. As he's kind of clumsy, and they're all afraid of getting stepped on at some point. I'll need a smith, and he sounds like a good man, said Paul. You sign him up for me, and he can join me later. Meanwhile, I'll get busy, as I have said, and will manage to see you again before long. And after making further arrangements for his wife to accompany the deacon back to town, where she was to remain while he was in the woods, Paul started away, followed by Babe the Great Blue Ox. He traveled many miles through the forest and over mountains and figured that he must be getting near the deacon's tract of woodland. Then, all at once, he began to hear sounds like long peals of nearby thunder. He looked at the sky and saw that the sun was setting perfectly clear with not a cloud to be seen, so he knew there could be no storm coming up. As he went on, the sounds grew louder, and Paul became more puzzled than ever. Finally, he came out into a cleared space on the side of a mountain, 
where a forest fire had swept the slope clean of trees from bottom to top. And there he saw a very strange thing. Hearing the thundering noise again, he looked ahead and was surprised to see a great round stone as big as a house rolling down the mountainside towards the valley below. It came bounding along at great speed, gaining momentum at every turn, and as it rolled along, it jarred the earth with the thunderous sounds he had been hearing. But strangest of all was the man who was running along beside it, holding something tightly against it as it turned over and over. Paul looked more closely and saw other stones rolling down the hill in the same manner, and along with each one, keeping pace with it, was a tall, strongly built man with something in his hand. Thanks for joining us today. Check us out on Patreon. The storytime level is only $3, and you can help us meet our small goal of breaking even and covering our expenses. Your support helps pay for all of the things that podcasting requires and helps keep this show alive and growing. If you can't afford to support us financially, go give us a good review, subscribe or follow, and share with your friends and family. Feel free to fact check us and offer suggestions to make our show better for you. You can also send us an email at lostinrevisionpodcast at gmail.com. There's a lot more waiting for us all at the end of the road.